As we continue our series this evening, going through Revelation chapter 2, picking up where we left off with verse 8, we come to the second of these seven letters written to these seven churches located in the region of Asia Minor. And this is about the shortest one of them all. It's only uh, these four verses, verses 8 through 11. And it's to the church at Smyrna. And those brothers and sisters who were there at Smyrna have the not only uh, fame of being written to and being talked about here in the scriptures mentioned by name, but they're one of, as we mentioned this morning, only two out of these seven, less than a third of these congregations, only two were written that had no open rebuke, no condemnation, no problems going on at the congregation that they were told to address or to repent of. Only good things written to this congregation, good in the sense that they were not involved in anything sinful, something that they needed to change, but at the same time we see uh, from looking at this letter, it doesn't take long to realize they weren't in exactly what you would call a good or a nice situation. Certainly not a comfortable one. As we did this morning, let's start off just by reading the letter itself, and then we'll go through and more closely examine what we're looking at as far as the content of it. Starting there with verse 8, it says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So again, as you can see, it's very brief. It's very short. And there's nothing that's written to this church as far as what they were doing wrong. What they needed to repent of. Things that they needed to correct. There were no issues like that going on. Just things that were outwardly affecting this congregation. And the things that they were going through. The things that they were actively having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want us to keep that in mind because it's so easy for us to read this letter as much as it is any of the other letters, to read these things and simply take them at face value. To say, well, we know that they were facing persecution. Well, we can make that same broad, sweeping statement about the entire Bible. We can look at the New Testament and say, well, we know they're in the first century. They experienced persecution that we just don't know, that we haven't seen and we're not familiar with. We might hear stories about other places in the globe where people are in fear for their lives or might lose a whole lot because they dare to call themselves Christians. But for us here now in this country, it's a rather foreign concept to us. And we just kind of vaguely understand that it was a lot tougher back then. But rather than just keeping it at arm's length and just making that broad stroke statement that, well, they had a very difficult time, understand what it must have been like day in and day out, week after week, to have to live like that. Because that's the reality of this congregation. We're not just talking about how hard it must have been to be a Christian as far as coming together and assembling and worshiping and talking about God and being afraid or not to pray in public and different things like that, but what it meant just to live as a Christian, especially for those who had spouses and children and things to, to think about and people to worry about and provide for and what that might mean for them on a daily basis, the pressure that they were under. And again, we talked about some of that uh, this morning with the church in Ephesus, that they were under that toil, that there was that labor, there was that heavy load placed upon them. But when it comes to Smyrna, we look at what we're dealing with here and the two words that's used to describe their situation are tribulation and poverty. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time dissecting every word here. We know in general what the word tribulation means. It's often paired with trials. It's a trying time. It's, it's a hard time where we're not sure what's going to happen next. We're not sure what the solution is. We just know it's not good. We know this isn't pleasant. We want this to be over. And we're going through tribulation. And those moments we just say usually we have to trust in God. 
And sadly, sometimes so many people say when it comes to hard times like that, they say, well, the only thing that we can do is pray, acting as if that's somehow our last resort when it should be our first reaction. But again, this congregation, he says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. So why is it that this congregation, why were they going through so much tribulation? Well, he says very specifically that they were under attack, that they had been slandered, they had been falsely accused. Now, we don't know of what, and we really don't need to know. If we did, it would have mentioned it in detail. But they were accused with slander by those, he says, who say they are Jews and are not, but he says they are a synagogue of Satan. And looking back at Romans chapter 2, it kind of sheds some light on what he's talking about here. Of those who say they are Jews, but are not. Over in Romans chapter 2, they're looking at verses 28 and 29, as Paul's writing there to the church at Rome. He says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So the individuals who were greatly opposing this church here at Smyrna, who were causing so many problems for this congregation, we don't know hardly anything about them. We don't know any names. We don't know if they held high-ranking positions in the city, if they were men, people of influence. We're not told. But we are told that they called themselves Jews. They say they are Jews. He says they are not. The letter here of Revelation written by, by John, inspired by the Spirit, was written in the early 90s A.D. Most scholars tend to agree that. So this is long after the church had been founded, 33 A.D. on the day of Pentecost. And this is after the, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Now when the church came into existence there on the day of Pentecost, that was ushering in the, the new law. The old had been completely fulfilled by Christ. He had done everything that needed to be done. He is bringing in the new. The Jews were supposed to get with the program and do what God wanted them to do, to come to Christ. And now there's a new law, not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. But of course we know so many didn't. They continued to oppose that. They didn't like the idea of bringing in the Gentiles. They wanted to remain as God's special people. They didn't want to give that up. And like all of us, they were hesitant to change. But the real final nail in this coffin came on 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. Now the temple is gone. Now all of that is gone, including the records of all the different tribes and the descendants. They don't know the ones of Levi, or at least they wouldn't in a few generations. That knowledge would eventually be, be swept away. Isn't it clear by now that God does not intend for you to live under the old law? But yet... People still clung to that, as there are so many today who still try to follow the religion of Judaism. So these individuals call themselves Jews. And to their credit, I'm sure they tried as best they could to continue worshiping and functioning under the old law concerning some of these things. And they were most likely, as well, Jews by their ancestry, that they were physically the descendants of Abraham. So they say they were Jews. I'm sure they were circumcised, but he says they are not. It doesn't matter who their fathers and grandfathers and how much they could trace their line back. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they're circumcised. It doesn't matter that they're following so much of the old law. If they aren't paying attention to God's will, if they're not one inwardly, if they don't have that circumcision of the heart, then he says, none of the rest of that matters at all. They considered themselves Jews. They again gathered there in that synagogue in Smyrna, but they were not doing what God wanted them to do. Nowhere even close. We see the same thing expressed over in Philippians chapter 3. If you turn there quickly before we move on. Philippians chapter 3, starting there with verse 2. He says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul's talking about himself, a Christian. He's writing to the Philippians, fellow Christians. He says, we are the circumcision. 
You know, the Lord's church, this is what God intended. Like we said, he brought in the church, 33 AD. This is a new law. The old law is done. It's fulfilled. It's, it's over. It says we are the service mission. We are spiritually Israel. We are God's people today. But these people just didn't understand that or didn't want to. And they didn't like what was going on. So here they are opposing God, opposing this church, this group of people, these believers here in Smyrna. And of course, from what we're reading here, Jesus has nothing bad to say to them. No rebuke, no condemnation. So since clearly the Jews didn't have any real kind of ammunition, nothing to say bad against them, they have to lie. And they slander them to try to make them look bad. They do anything they can, coming up with all kinds of ridiculous stories to try to go against this church. And part of that is why we see the word poverty used here to describe them. It's not just the fact that they were under tribulation, that they were having to deal with lies being spread about them, but part of this, apparently, from what we can tell from the historical context, includes the fact that they were, they were reporting the members of the church there in Smyrna for refusing to worship the Caesar at the time, who would be Nero, he was emperor, refusing to worship him as being divine. We know that was part of the Roman culture, that they worshiped the emperor as if he were a god. And if you refuse to do so, it would hold some pretty serious consequences. Over in chapter 13 of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 13, looking at verses 16 and 17, it says, Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. If you refused to worship and as such pledge allegiance to the emperor, you would be blacklisted. You would be shut out of the marketplace, not able to buy or sell. And this might be one of those cases where if no one made a point of it, then you could get away with it. But here the Jews are making a point to show they haven't pledged allegiance to the emperor. They don't worship him. They say he's not divine. They say he's not a god. Now, if these ones, these Jews of this synagogue, were trying to follow the old law as they should, they weren't doing it either. But of course, whether they were or weren't, it didn't stop them from pointing a finger and trying to get these individuals, these brothers and sisters there at Smyrna, trying to get them into trouble any which way they could. So not only is this tribulation as far as causing problems for them, it's causing their poverty. Now, we might have read, uh, as we read earlier in Revelation chapter 2, where it describes their tribulation and their poverty, we might have read that and just assumed, well, they weren't very wealthy people. And we understand that as far as we look at the scriptures, we look at the New Testament. Most of the time, those who belong to the Lord's church weren't very well off. They were blue-collar people. I mean, look at the apostles. They were fishermen. They weren't very influential in society. They weren't the higher-ups of this world. There were some, there were a few who did have some money and some possessions, but by and large, they just weren't that wealthy. So again, we might read that and think, well, they, this just happens to be a poor church. And maybe so. It could be that they just weren't very wealthy to begin with. But knowing this, we know on top of that, they're being forced into poverty because of what's being said about them. Because this synagogue of Satan, because these Jews here are stirring up trouble and trying to make their life that much harder. Because they don't like the gospel message. Because they don't like that there is a church here in Smyrna that's teaching that the old law is done away with. They're teaching there's now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And that this Jesus, he was the Messiah, but he was put to death. It's not a popular message, not one that they want to hear. And like we've said, life was already hard enough, don't you think? I mean, this life all on its own can beat us down, can wear us out. It can be discouraging just to do what you need to do, to live and work and eat, to provide for yourself and your family. But look at what they were facing on top of that. Slander from these people and now being forced into outright poverty because you're scrambling to try to make any kind of money because it's known that you don't worship the emperor, that you don't see him as being divine because you worship 
another God. So this is what they are facing. And again, that on a daily basis, tribulation and poverty. So I mean, we think sometimes we have it pretty rough and we think that we need to be encouraged and we need to be edified. We can certainly say that about this congregation. They needed someone to encourage them. They needed to be cheered up, to have someone tell them that it's okay, that they're going to, they're going to make it. And you know, that's exactly what we see here. While we don't see any kind of rebuke or any kind of condemnation from Jesus as he's writing to this church, what we see instead is an exhortation, that he is exhorting them, he is encouraging them. And the way he does so at first is indirectly. He doesn't say much. In our Bibles, it's put into parentheses there, right after he says that he knows their poverty. He says, but you are rich. It's interesting to try to imagine. Ultimately, of course, it's just speculation and we don't know, but it's interesting to imagine what it must have been like for the church to have this letter read aloud to hear this read publicly, that this was a revelation given to John. This is, these are the words of Christ. This is God speaking directly to you, and He tells you that you are rich, knowing what they were going through, knowing how hard their physical situation was, and for that to sink in and understand what He meant by it. Because they weren't, they weren't dumb. They knew He wasn't talking about physically being rich, physically having that type of wealth. So what must he have meant when he says, but you are rich? Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. There, verses 8 and 9. It speaks of how we are rich. He says in verse 8, he says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. What riches do we have? Forgiveness of sin. Salvation. Eternal life. It doesn't get any better than that. What's the most valuable thing that you can imagine? soul. Having that debt of sin forgiven. This thing that we could never accomplish on our own. Freely offered by God. That Jesus came, died on the cross so that we can have it. So that we have access to it. And there's so many of His parables that describe this fact. He likens the kingdom of heaven to a man in search of pearls. And a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And what did they do? They went and they sold all they had because they recognized the value of it. They saw it was the only thing that mattered. It was the only thing that they needed. So Christ coming down, Him living that perfect life, being that perfect sacrifice, dying, rising again, that is what makes us rich. Rich spiritually, maybe not physically. We might go through this whole life and not have more than enough to put food on the table, and that's okay. We can be rich. He says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. He's trying to put this into a different perspective for them. He's reminding them of what really matters. Not that they needed to be reminded necessarily. Again, clearly if he's not saying that they have anything they need to correct, if he's not rebuking them, this is a good congregation who's trying their best to do the right thing. But he's saying this to encourage them, to let them see, you know, you really are rich. The riches of God's grace being poured out on you to have your sins forgiven. What an exhortation. You are rich. You know, you're told something by someone, you might... You know, take it at face value. You thank them for saying it if it was nice, but you maybe shrug it off, depending on who it's coming from, what the source is. And maybe you think they're biased. But this is Jesus talking. When Jesus tells you something, you don't ignore it. 
You don't second guess that. He says you are rich. They don't have to wonder. They don't have to doubt that. They know we're rich. We're rich because of what he has done for us. And the exhortation that he gives to them that you are rich, and on top of that, as we saw, for them to be faithful, to remain steadfast, is not only a good exhortation, a good encouragement to give someone any time, to stay with it, to stick with it, to stay the course, but they especially need to hear this when, as he's telling them, things are going to go from bad to worse. You look at the letter, as we read it earlier, you look at what he writes to Smyrna, what's the main body of that letter, what's he talking to them about? how they're going to be tested, how they're going to face even more persecution. We'll talk about that in a minute, but since you know, they're already in such a rough spot and now they're going to face even more, they need to hear that you be faithful. Over in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, starting there with verse 4. It says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. To keep that in the forefront of your mind, of what Christ has done for you, knowing that He was the sacrifice for your sins, and that now we're made new. This washing of renewal that He's poured out on us. He's given it to us. And now we are rich, and because of that, we need to devote ourselves to good works. Similar to what we were talking about this morning with the Ephesian church, as they had a very good work ethic. They were extremely hard, diligent workers for the Lord, even though they were a little off on some things. They were misguided in their motivation for it. This is what happens when we appreciate Christ's death, when we appreciate everything that He went through for us, and we know how rich we are to be Christians, that we can be called the children of God, is that it shows in our life that we remain faithful, we devote ourselves to good works. And it doesn't matter what other people are going to do. And it doesn't matter what's happening to us at this point in our lives. We don't say, well, you know, I would do more, but it's a really hard time for me right now. If you really care about God, if you're really striving to put Him first, it doesn't matter what your situation is. They were under tribulation. They were under poverty. And here He is encouraging them to keep on keeping on, to do what they're doing, to not give up, to not take it easy for a while. Most of us, if we were in a hard spot, we might think, well, I should just lay low, and then when things get better, then I can do more. They didn't take the easy way out. They didn't try to make an excuse. And he's not giving them one. He says, you are rich. Keep that in mind. Don't forget it. Don't act like you're not. Don't act like you're the most troubled person in the world. You're rich. And he says, be faithful. Be faithful unto death. Over in 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 16. It says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. You notice those last three words? It's not just that, well, 
I'm facing persecution and I'm suffering, but I'm going to trust that, that God is, is in control. We don't just place our trust in Him and sit back and like we said, lay low, take it easy, and think maybe that we, we can do this later and now is not the right time. Yes, we entrust our, our souls to Him, we place it all on Him, but we continue doing good. We keep doing the works that we know we need to be doing. We keep doing the work of the church that we know is pleasing to God. And I know the different, uh, the different translations sometimes use a different word here. Some say unto and some say until. And maybe it doesn't matter much one way or the other. Maybe, like we said at one point in our lesson this morning, it's just semantics and the funny way that the English language works. But it's fitting when it says be faithful unto death. Because the word until just regards a time frame. How long do I have to remain faithful? Until death. But unto death implies not only the same time frame, not only that same thought, but also the fact that that's how much we're to be faithful. Unto death. Even if it comes to that point, and it very well could for these people. For this congregation at Smyrna, knowing everything that they're already going through, it's not that huge of a leap to think that they might die. But he says, you be faithful unto death. It doesn't matter if it comes to that. You remain faithful. And maybe we can think of some of the other words that we would swap in there. Words that coincide with faithfulness. Loyalty. Trustworthiness. We're to be loyal to God. We're to continue trusting in Him. We're to live our lives in a way that people can trust that we're going to do what God wants us to do. And not compromise what we know to be right. And not refuse to speak the truth. Not stay silent and let a lie be spoken. That we continue being faithful to Him. No matter the cost. No matter what others might say or what they might do to us. We remain faithful because... As he told them there, if we are, he says, we will have a crown of life. But we look at the situation that they were in. And like we said, it was about to go, as he's telling them, from bad to worse. He says that they're going to suffer. And he tells them who's behind it. He says it's Satan. The devil is going to do this. You know, we, we talk so much about that local synagogue causing problems for them, and he describes them as being a synagogue of Satan. And while those people, misguided in their, in their views, probably thinking that they were doing the right thing, just as much as Saul of Tarsus lived his life in good conscience, thinking it was what God wanted. But we understand those people weren't really the enemy. Just as much as for us today, anyone that would cause us some problems, they're not our enemy. They're just another human being, another soul that needs God. The enemy is Satan. The devil is the one who's going to cause these problems. He's the one who's been causing so much trouble for them already. He says the devil is about to cause you trouble and tribulation. He says you're going to be thrown into prison. And the fact that he's telling them ahead of time, Revelation, of course, is this book of prophecy. He's telling them what's going to take place in the near future. But he's telling them exactly what to expect. And maybe we would think on some level that that would make things easier. Well, if you know what's coming, you can kind of prepare for the blow, right? Not necessarily. We might think so, but we've never been in that situation. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, as Paul, as we discussed not too long ago, is writing this letter near the end of his life. He's writing from prison, knowing that he's soon going to be facing execution. He says in verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 
and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Those of us here, we've never been in Paul's position. We have never been put into prison. Though we have literally lost our freedom just because we're a Christian, just because we speak the truth. So, you know, we might say that for the church there at Smyrna, that they're being told that they're about to, to suffer, that the devil's going to throw some of them into prison. Well, at least they know what's coming, what's to expect there. But in the heat of the moment, when they're there in that prison, they might be wondering what's going to happen to them. And they don't know exactly what the future holds. They knew some of it. They knew to expect prison, but he didn't go into detail after that, aside that they're to remain faithful unto death. And they might be wondering, well, now here I am in prison for the sake of the Lord. What's going to happen to me? And does anyone really care? You know, Paul was writing to Timothy here. He told him not to be ashamed of the gospel. He said, don't be ashamed of me. It's prisoner. A lot of people don't want to be associated with someone who's in prison or who has that in their, in their past, on their record. That they were a prisoner? And those there at Smyrna might have wondered, are the other members going to pretend like they don't know who I am? That they're not going to have anything to do with me? Much like the way Peter denied Jesus. I don't know the man. I don't know who you're talking about. Because they're afraid of being associated. So yeah, they knew what was coming ahead of time because of this letter, but it might not have necessarily made it any easier to deal with. And he told them, you're going to face tribulation for ten days. Okay. Again, that doesn't sound too bad when you put it into those type of terms. And especially the fact that he says ten days. That's a definite time period, right? So that means that, okay, we just have to get through these next 10 days and there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we know it's not going to last forever. Again, that doesn't sound too bad. We could probably deal with something like that. Well, it's easy for us to say, not having been through what they went through. First of all, he just says they're going to suffer a tribulation 10 days. He doesn't say how bad that tribulation is going to be. How intense that suffering for those 10 days is going to be. You know, you're told to do something, you only have to do it for one day, but a lot of us would ask what that thing is before we sign up for it. They didn't know. And even though he says you're going to face tribulation 10 days, are we really going to try to tell ourselves that after that 10-day period that, that Jesus is talking about there in Revelation chapter 2, as soon as those 10 days were over, their life was nothing but a bed of roses after that? You don't really believe that. Do you? Have you ever known someone that their entire life, everything goes just right for them? Of course not. Like we said, this life all on its own, the fact that time and chance happen to all men, this life is hard. It's difficult. We get discouraged. It's why we meet multiple times a week to try to build one another up. So yes, they were told ahead of time what to expect, but we shouldn't think that that somehow made it that much easier. And yes, they were given this time frame of 10 days, but after those 10 days were over, it didn't mean that Satan would leave them alone forever. Of course not. You look over, if you're still in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3. Looking there at verses 12 and 13, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Not some, not many, all. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
might not be the same kind of persecution. might be different levels of intensity behind it, but we're going to face persecution in this life, even if we never face the same kind of situation that the church in Smyrna was. If we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, and I hope that we do, then we're going to face hardship. And hardship beyond the regular problems of this life, the aches, the pains, the worries over paying bills, persecution just because we want to follow the Scriptures. Because we wear the name of Christian. And we're not given a time frame on that. That it will only last 10 days or 10 months. The thought behind this is it's going to be continual. As long as we want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we're going to face persecution. The only way it stops is if we give in. Is if we say, it's not worth it. If we say that, I'm not going to go through any more of this. That we're just going to go along with whatever the world has to say. That we're going to do what they would have us do, even though we know it goes against God's will. Because we're tired. Because we're tired of being beaten down again and again. And we can see that would be a very tempting position for those there at Smyrna to take. With how hard it was already, how bad it was, and knowing it's going to get even worse. Not exactly what you would call an encouraging message in that sense. But it's exactly what the Lord told them while saying, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And they're to be tested. That's what he said. That doing that would test them. How have you in your life, up to this point, been tested? And how have you come through that test? Over in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 6, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." When we face trials in this life, and it tests us, it tests our faith. It tests our loyalty to God. It tests how far we're willing to go as a Christian. The comparison there is made to refining gold. A literal trial by fire for that. To burn away the impurities. To make it better. Sometimes when we're tested, that's what happens. Sometimes when we're tested, we stumble. We fall. We're not good enough. But we need to be willing in those instances to pick ourselves up and start again, to try again, and not give up, not lose heart. But when we are tested, if we remain true to God, if we lean on Him, and we come through that test, we're going to be better. We're going to be stronger for it, as unpleasant as it is in the immediate sense. For the future, we're going to be better. We're going to draw that much closer to God, and really, when we go through times of adversity together, that much closer to one another. It should bind the church together. That we know why we're suffering, that we know that we're going through hard times, but we have the same hope. Not in this life, not in physical riches, but in the riches of God, of His grace, and of seeing Christ when He comes in His glory. That's what we need to look forward to. It's what those at Smyrna had to look forward to. After their tribulation, after their poverty, after being tested, all of that. What did they have to look forward to? That crown of life. 
It meant being faithful unto death. It meant commitment. And it's a funny thing to ask, but as we read this letter, as we think about these things, do we envy the church there? And I think we would safely say we don't envy them. The tribulation, the poverty, we're glad we're not in their shoes when it comes to that. But the fact that these people weren't given any kind of rebuke. You know, again, one of only two. To so just be commended by the Lord. Be exhorted. We should say that that's who we want to be. We want to be a congregation of the Lord's people. We want to be a church that's doing what's right. That we don't need to be corrected because we're putting up with false doctrine or like Ephesus, we have left our first love. We want to be doing what we ought to be doing. And it doesn't matter that they were facing all that hardship and all that tribulation. It didn't matter their physical poverty. Jesus says they were rich. Jesus says if they kept doing what they were doing, if they remained faithful, they would have that crown of life. What a wonderful thing to hear. And as we bring the lesson to a close, take a moment to extend the Lord's invitation to those who have never named Christ, never put Him on in baptism, or for those who are members of the Lord's body and yet need to make correction in their life. We so often reference that verse, Revelation 2.10, that talks about being faithful unto death. And it means so much. Because it is a commitment. It's not something to be done casually or to be taken lightly. To say that you're going to be a Christian, a child of God, means you're going to follow after Him. It means you're making that change in your life, that you repent of your sins, you turn away from them, you're turning towards God because of the faith that you have. Because you want to be His child. And from that moment, we so often talk as if baptism is the last step, and really it's the first. From that moment, you live not for yourself, not for your family or anyone else. You live for Him. And we do it all because of what He told them for that crown of life. Because we know it's worth it in the end. Because we know ultimately it's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have in this life. It doesn't matter how nice your life here on earth might be. It doesn't compare to eternity. What God is offering us is the only thing that's worth everything. And we know the alternative is not what we want. To be eternally separated from God. That's not what He wants for us either. He wants us to be with Him in heaven. Where there's no pain no suffering, no worries, no sadness. That's what He offers. But He leaves the choice up to you and me. So if tonight you need to be obedient to the gospel plan of salvation, if you need to repent of your sins, if you believe in God's Word, if you've heard the gospel preached, as we have tonight, repent of those sins. Turn away from them. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Not be ashamed of that faith. Be baptized, buried with Him, immersed in that water to rise to walk in newness of life. That's how one becomes a child of God. But if you have done so, if you've made that decision, and since then, you've not been living as you should. Maybe you have compromised or given up, taken the easy way out. There's time to change that. Either way, if you have spiritual needs this evening, would you come have a seat on the front while we stay? While we stay.